Hey folks, Joe Valley here. Thank you for joining us for another episode of the Quiet Light Podcast. And I say us because I've got my co-host here, Mr. Pat Yates. Pat, how are you? I'm doing great, Joe. How are you? I'm doing fantastic. I love interviews like this where it's an incredible exits episode. Somebody that, in this case, bought a business, doubled the uh, doubled doubled the revenue, doubled the value of it, and yeah. then sold it three years later, all while being in school full time. And no, she's not 25. She's an adult that decided to go right. back to school and follow her passion. It's just, uh, I love these types of stories. Yeah, it's amazing when you listen or you look at a, a deal on paper. Let's just say I watched it on paper. You don't know anything about what the person's been through. Listening to Stacy talk about this so passionately about going back to school, looking for retirement money and following a map to be able to make a business successful and then resell it. She did everything the way you would want to do it and actually had some tough experiences along the line trying to sell it, which led her back to Quiet Light, which is amazing. The whole story is just fantastic. She's an amazing entrepreneur. Yeah, I think the key message, folks, as you listen to this, is that she didn't do this alone. First, right. she had help and, and learned about how to buy a business from uh, Jared Krause, who was on the podcast uh, just a few episodes ago. He runs a company yeah. called buyingonlinebusinesses.com. Check that out. So she got help from him first. And then she uh, joined uh, a mastermind group in the content space, got lots of help from those folks and built a team. She didn't do it alone at all, right. which was kind of uh, the mature aspect of, of her being an entrepreneur, right? Too many of us, as, as her and I were talking before, we've all got kids that are, you know, late teens, 20s, you've got one that's 30. And yeah. more often than not, they say, mom, dad, I got this. Yeah. Right? And, and, and when you're a, a little bit more experienced, a little more seasoned, you don't say that as often and you get help and you build a team around you. And that's exactly what Stacy did. I think tons and tons of lessons to be learned here. I, I think the biggest lesson is the one you pointed out. For the people out there that were thinking about building a business, a lot of time there's a vanity to reaching out to a broker or to someone that can help you acquire a business. A lot of people either don't want to spend the money or they feel like they know everything. The truth is the same line we always use. You don't know what you don't know. Stacy was smart enough to reach out in the in the beginning, in the middle, and at the end. And all those things led to the perfect scenario. So people can't overlook those things, no matter how smart you are or what direct deal you think you have. There are always going to be hiccups. You need to lean on people, no matter what part of the business or in the exit. So she did a great job of putting the right people around her to make this scenario perfect. She did. Let's uh, let's jump in and see what she's got to say. Here we go. Stacy, welcome to the Quiet Life Podcast. How are you? I'm good. Thank you guys for having me. Our pleasure. Congratulations first on your successful exit. This is uh, my favorite type of podcast to record an incredible exit series where we talk about people that have either built and then sold a business or launched it and eventually sold it as well. So can you, for the, uh, for the audience that doesn't know who you are, can you give a little bit of background on yourself? Sure. Um, I am actually, my background is in healthcare. Um, and, uh, I was, uh, wanting to increase my scope of practice. I'm a physical therapist and I wanted to, um, go into, uh, become a nurse practitioner to be able to do more things in my clinic. Um, and so I was going back to school to do that. And I thought, well, what, what can I do while I'm in full time in school that is going to pay for school for me? And then um, I started looking into websites to purchase when I was working as a director of a company because uh, I knew I was going to be quitting that to go to school. So um, and then had the business for almost three years, sold it successfully, very happy with the sale. And then, um, yeah, and then I'm now expanding my clinic as well. It's pretty impressive that you, you know, as a professional decided to go back to school and you had to say, oh, how do I, how do I cover my expenses while I'm in school and right. buying an online business? Like you're more in the brick and mortar space. I could see your background. You've got clients that come in and work with you now. What made you think online and what made you think content site? Sure. I had a business in Australia that was online and offline. So we did services, but we, you know, sold products um, as well online just to our, our clients or our patients. And um, so I had a little bit of understanding of online, offline uh, type thing. And we grew that part of our business substantially. So when I sold that business, I came back to the U.S., um, as we were talking about earlier, that my son was going to school, wanted to come back to school to go in the U.S. So we came back. 
And I, I took about a year off to kind of figure out what I was doing, but then saw that a lot of what I had um, earned from my sale kind of dwindle over time. And when I was thinking about going back to school, I thought, I don't want that to dwindle, <laughs> right? So I don't want to utilize my, um, you know, my savings in order to pay for this. So what can I do from a passive income point of view? I have a little bit of real estate, so I understand that concept. So I thought, okay, not that doing the website was passive um, completely, uh, but I thought, well, what can I do to do this? So I started looking at different sites that were for, for sale, um, more in the content range, which was a different area. I was more kind of an e-commerce, but only to my patients um, around Australia. So um, yeah, that's what made me think, all right, I, I don't want to kind of dwindle down my savings again. Uh, what can I utilize uh, to, you know, help pay for this from a passive income yeah. point of view, you know, the old rich dad, poor dad kind of concept. Um, and yeah, that's when I started researching. It probably took me eight to, you know, eight to 12 months to research just how to buy a site online. Because um, what I purchased previously was a brick and mortar that we grew the um, online part of it. And then uh, took a, a few courses online to figure it all out. And then um, just started researching kind of like what I've done with uh, rental properties, researching the websites and getting the background of them. And and that came up with the one that I ended up with in food and beverage. You know, Stacey, I, I talk to a lot of people that have e-com businesses and I talk to them about buying content and you might as well speak Japanese to them. because It's like <laughs> some people, whether it's weird because there's a lot of people that don't feel they can get their hands around content because because the consumer's not buying it. They're not certain that they can scale something like that. What made you, when you're deciding to go into this, uh, move away from e-com to content specifically? And some people say it's financial because they don't want to buy product. And others say that they just have more expertise. What What was the reason that you decided that? Well, I went into, I had a small little uh, Amazon store and um, that um, became, got shut down by, I don't know if it was a competitor that said I had faulty product or something like that, but it was growing steadily. And then it kind of got shut down and I'm like, oh my God, I don't know if I want to deal with this thing, you know, over and over again. And it was my side hustle, right? So I didn't have a lot of time to put into it. So then when I didn't even know you could, you got money for content sites, it wasn't even like in my in my space, but then as I was researching different websites to buy, I saw these sites about display advertising, and I was like, "Huh, wonder if you can make any money with that." And then, um, yeah, just with a little bit more research, I was like, "Now, all right, so I don't have a product there, so all I have to do is you know buy a site that's already has these display ads on it, and then if I could apply the knowledge that I have to improving that site, improving the experience." then potentially I could make more money or at least pay for my schooling, right? That was my main goal um, to do that. Um, and then, yeah, so that's, it, it was just kind of a, you know, I got knocked down with e-commerce uh, from Amazon. That was a bit of a pain in the butt. And then I thought, okay, well, display advertising should be more straightforward, uh, content site um, more straightforward. And it was, but it still was, it still had its, you know, difficulties and, and stressors for sure. I, I want to talk about the monetization and something that you just said there as well, which was the experience that you had, which doesn't sound like you had a whole lot of experience in the content right. space. So that was the training that you got is, is that your experience was what you, the courses you took online? The training that I had was really more about researching websites. Um, okay. And then the training on the content site was um, after I purchased it, uh, kind of digging into it and seeing, okay, who knows what they're doing in the space and then finding out, you know, becoming a member of their Facebook group and then listening and talking to them. Um, the nice thing about the site that I chose to buy, it was already generating revenue from the content space with the display advertising. So um, from that point, I had a little bit of a cushion to learn more, right, and dig in because income was already there. Uh, and then my idea was then to just grow that income based on uh, SEO because the person that I bought it from uh, admittedly so was like, yeah, I didn't really pay much attention to that. She got most of her um, recognition from being on local shows or she was out there more of a influencer media personality. Uh, and I wanted to do the opposite. I wanted to move away from that and make it more of a general site so that when I did want to sell it, um, it wasn't about pulling somebody's face off of the site. It was more just about, you know, selling that that site that anybody could step in and, and do it. How much fear did you have when you bought it that that the original founder was kind of the name and face of the site. Was that a big concern for you? And did you negotiate 
maybe leaving her name on there for a while or her image on for a while? What did you do yes, there? Yes, we did. So um, she was absolutely wonderful and is wonderful. We're still in touch. And she and I talked about the fact she had this following. Um, the nice thing about it is in the probably the year or two prior to her exiting, she built up another following from her her current following that she had started the site back in, I think, 2008. So she had another passion that she wanted to um, uh, really move towards online. So um, she had built that part up. So what we decided to do was go, OK, let's just do a, a, a handover that every, you know, we, we did a video. She introduced me. We talked about our backgrounds. We talked about how we met. Um, we made it so that the site wouldn't change. This was just, you know, me, I was helping her out before the sale. And then um, I'm kind of managing it now. We actually didn't mention sale. We just basically said I'd be managing the site now and it's not going to change and she'd still be around. And she was great with commenting on stuff as things were posted. Um, so she was really supportive in that transition, um, probably for the first three to six months and then occasionally here and there after that. So that was what we negotiated prior to so that it would be such a, you know, blatant, okay, she's not here anymore and we never hear from her again. And of course we lost some, some, some subscribers as a result of that. I, I really, I figured that out, but we gained more as well. Um, as we, I started to become more educational in the posts that we put up versus just a, a stories about um, her life. It was more educational about, about the um, topic that, you know, the site was surrounded about on. You know, to expand on what Joe asked, I know that one thing that might intimidate some people about coming into content businesses is the fact that like in e com you have channels and people buy a product. That's pretty much how this works. But with you, you have advertising, you have sponsorship, you have all kinds of opportunities to bring products in, you know, linking affiliate. There's so many options, which are great. How do you go through the process to decide what you wanted your your site to be about? And, and did you eliminate some of those because you just don't like that path? Or how did you decide on that? So um, talking to some of the people that had the sites that were um, as big or bigger than the one that I purchased in regards to what do they do? So I kind of reverse engineered some of the more successful sites that are out there. I went out there, okay, are they doing affiliate? Is there much into affiliate for the particular site that I had? Um, what products are they doing affiliate for? Um, is there much in the way of sponsorship? Um, so I kind of geared my uh, my plan was to build up the affiliate. That was the big part first. Uh, and then it was just kind of dribs and drabs there. So I was putting a lot of energy into not getting a lot of returns. So we just kept the affiliates that we had. And then I looked more into sponsorship. And we got a few sponsorships where, um, you know, they a company approaches you or you approach that company and they have a specific um, ingredient um, or product that they want displayed, you create a post for them, you know, and, and they pay X amount of dollars. So we did some of that as well. Um, but really where the most bang for the, my buck was to take the um, the posts that were currently uh, not updated and maybe eight years, you know, five years, whatever, and start to update those for SEO. And that's where I saw the traffic increasing significantly. Uh, and then uh, optimizing my social media channels as well, too. Um, did have I was in Facebook jail for about a year. So that 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 hurt. Um, but overall, what does that mean? What does that mean? Uh, basically, Facebook um, said that I it was right when they kind of advertised that they had these bots to kind of monitor all the posts. So I put up a, a one of the things that I would do is an, a motivational quote every day in the morning. And one was a quote saying something like, um, if you're at the end of your rope, hang in there. Um, it'll get better or something like that. Well, rope and hang. Yeah, um, not so a good combination. Flag the bots. Yeah. Oh. Which, which me, I was like, what if like a human read this, they know this is like supportive and I want to help you. But they said I was posting something about suicide and I was like, no, but anyway, and then as you probably know, or listeners may know is that Facebook, there's really nobody to talk to. Like, you know, you can appeal and you can appeal and they can keep saying no and keep saying no. Right. And usually within 30 to 60 days, they kind of lift those restrictions. Um, and then what happened is uh, that didn't happen after 60 days. So I just kept on, you know, contacting them. Uh, uh, one of my contractors helped as well because she has other other clients where she was able to talk, at least talk to a human. Um, so they lifted the monetization restrictions after about four months. But then um, they weren't my impressions were like went from two million to 10,000, right? So, um, and then gradually over a year, it increased, but almost exactly the day 
potentially even the hour that they took that post down, um, then things started to increase again. So I had over 400,000 followers and I was getting like 10,000 impressions a day, a bit ridiculous. So then it started to increase again. And then uh, when I sold it, I was up to another 700,000 impressions a day. Um, How much did that affect your income in that first year? Uh, significantly, because um, it was right around COVID and um, we, but it would have affected it. See, I, the goal for Facebook that I saw others being successful at was creating a monetization of Facebook through ads and things. And so you had to get so many views of your videos in order to qualify for that program. So I was just on the verge of getting that to be able to qualify for it. So I wasn't really monetizing it at that point, but I was on the verge of monetizing it. Um, and then that all kind of collapsed. So then um, what, just before I sold, <laughs> I was laughing with the owner or the new owners. I was like, okay, sure. Yeah. Now I've been working for three years. And so, and now I get monetization for Facebook and now I'm handing this to you. So you're welcome. You know, so their, should, their income should increase as a result of, of that monetization for Facebook videos um, as well too. And then we started to get into reels bonuses um, and we were getting a little bit of income from that. So prior to um, getting that monetization for the the long form videos, we had some additional income coming in from Facebook um, to uh, regarding the reels bonuses and stuff that we were doing on a consistent basis. Right. So you were focused on SEO and increasing monetization and a combination of both. Mm -hmm. um, and you've said we several times. Is we a euphemism for you and the business or did you have writers as well or a team that transferred with the sale? Yep. Another goal of mine, because I was in school full time and then I was also working and starting my clinic because I'm a crazy person. Um, I hired out to, for the um, uh, social media. The same person did um, what did she do, Pinterest and Instagram. I liked Facebook, so I kept doing that myself. So that was my own fun thing to do. Plus, my I did my, my emailing. Um, and then uh, she also did uh, Google Web Stories. And then I had somebody who I trained in SEO um, would also do the, we would uh, update the posts. So I spent a lot of time, more time updating existing posts and then doing some new posts um, a little bit here and there, probably about four, four new posts or so a month versus um, 20 redos. So we had over 2000 pages when I bought the site. So, um, so it was a lot, I think by the time I I sold it. I had redone like a thousand of the of the pages, and that generated significant traffic via um, organic traffic via Google um, because we were meeting their guidelines of what they expected for that type of site. And, and you learned how to do all of this. Sorry, Pat. You learned how to do all of this mostly from research or from the, uh, the content mastermind that you, that you joined. Content master. I, so uh, there was the. Um, the company that I joined to learn how to buy sites, right? So after that, done with them, then kind of didn't really join a content mastermind, but, you know, just listened and uh, and read and was on different Facebook groups um, of the same genre that I had. So kind of learned all that and then asked for recommendations, you know, who to go to for SEO. And then I learned from them. Uh, and I learned there's a lot of people that don't know what they're doing, charging a lot of money, and you're not getting really any any results. So then just went myself and then researched and then took that information and uh, found a contractor that I really liked. Um, and that took, you know, two or three people to go through, found the one that I really liked. And then she and I had a great relationship. Uh, um, and then she learned from me and then she started learning herself. So then I, instead of me watching all the webinars, I, you know, I paid her $20 an hour to do the SEO. Then I would go, hey, watch this hour long video on SEO. And, you know, let's talk about, you know, what what it was about and do you think it how it's applicable to um you know our site so when i say our and we i really think of the contractors and myself as this, this family kind of running running that site or team how Stacey, go ahead pat i'm not i keep interrupting because i'm no it's fascinating fine, Stacey, first story. of all i'm trying to figure out if we can finish early i'm looking at the site and all these recipes got me hungry i, I can't <laughs> imagine how you do this all day you probably have to eat but you know, going back to what you talked about is you choose those channels that you're going to be able to do where there are things that just do do certain patterns emerge that in, in those that become better revenue for you and you start concentrating on those more, whether it's SEO or sponsorship or whatever. Did you find that trends sort of came out that that led you in a right direction or or was they pretty consistent across the board? I think the trend that I rode as best that I could was COVID at that time um, with people staying at home, being online, yeah. looking at different recipes, things like that. Um, 
So I wanted to ride that as best as possible. And the display adds the traffic, everything like that was really good. But the interesting thing when I bought it, it hadn't, it hadn't increased in traffic significantly during COVID. So I purchased it or my LOI was in March, <laughs> March of 2020. Um, right before, I mean, right before we knew it was COVID was anything. And then I had an SBA loan. So that took like forever. We went through one lender and then that fell through and then went through another lender who only did SBA. And then we closed six months later. So we didn't close until September. So it was right before the elections. So I knew that, you know, the traffic and everything was going to be improving just generally, but we didn't, but what I was really interesting is I didn't see her traffic improve in that six months. It was very steady. I, I sure. had to check it every month just to make sure things weren't going backwards, um, but it was very steady. And then when I took over and literally did a few things from an SEO point of view, started really doing videos. Videos was a big aspect of the SEO. Um, it just really the the traffic during that election time and during the fourth quarter when it's usually really good anyway, just kind of ballooned and we doubled what her fourth quarter typically was previously. Wow. So that was great. So I'm like, wow, we got to ride this wave as long as we possibly can. And then that's when I really focused on the SEO and then tried to build the affiliates, but it just didn't, I don't know, it was probably my inexperience at building affiliates as well that really, it didn't really grab on. Um, so I just tried to ride the wave that was right in front of me instead of um, building new things out um, at that point in time. And then as we came, kind of came out of COVID, I had the Facebook you know, jail thing where that was kind of uh, affecting my traffic. I had to start thinking about other things. Okay, what else can we do besides the SEO? Um, so I really did focus a lot more on Google as far as being very specific about um, our journey on SEO and then um, looking at building up the other social channels and, you know, and checking out sponsorship opportunities. And then the Reels bonuses came up from Instagram. So that was helpful and in bringing in more income. So I really just tried to stay, keep my finger on the pulse by you know listening to other people who had been doing it a lot longer than me and then focusing on those things and kind of jumping on board and do trial and error as I went along. It sounds like you were doing a lot of things, learning a lot of things and going to school full time as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, how, how many hours a week were you putting in on average to the content business? Once I got the team together, Um, so in the beginning it was, I wasn't running my clinic probably for the first six months. It was just doing the website uh, and going to school. Um, but also school at that time was all online. So it was, there was a little bit more flexibility than having to go in somewhere. So it was really going to school, doing the website. And then that took me a while to, um, create my team. So that was probably, I don't know, 20 hours a week in the beginning and then studying and stuff. And then once I got my team together, it was less than 10 hours a week to really kind of just make sure that everything was moving and then doing some research as well, too. And I think for me, I love research. I love learning new things. So if if a person doesn't like to do that, <laughs> this is not for them because <laughs> it can be very frustrating. But for me, it was a challenge to, OK, that didn't work. So what can we do that will work? Because obviously people were doing well in the space. So why couldn't I you know, do as well as them? Oh. You know, Stacy, one thing that I wanted to ask, you know, you, were, you had a chance to work with Chris Guthrie, who is an amazing guy, just a great mm-hmm. advisor, and obviously were successful in your exit. It quite like we talk about the quality of conversations and the people we talk to and try to improve their business before they sell. Can you talk a little bit about, because you had a lot going on, you, mm-hmm. you really taking on a sale, even if it was after you were in school, is still a daunting process. Can you talk a little bit about how you qualified that, what your decision came down to, and maybe how the whole process went for you it, it, from a from a optic standpoint, not necessarily financial, just the whole process. Yeah, sure. I, I was going to ask the same thing in a much simpler way. It's like, why sell? You've got <laughs> yep. a great business generating great revenue, yeah. huge profits because it's a content site mm-hmm. and 10 hours a week. Yeah. Why sell? Yeah. As a, to answer that question, and then we'll get back to the, the other one was why sales, my goal in mind again was to pay for school, right? That's ultimately the goal. Now it's profiting more than I thought it w- that I was planning on doing, although I obviously wanted it to do that. Otherwise I wouldn't have worked on it like I did. Um, so in my mind, I thought, okay, wh- where's my passion? Is this my passion? Is this what I want to do for long term? I liked it. I didn't love it. It was interesting. Um, and I wanted to expand my clinic. So going back to my original goal of even going back to school, um, I just started to look and see, okay, what potentially could I get for the site now the way it's performing versus the way, versus the way that I was. it was performing when I purchased it? 
So I was kind of putting feelers out there. And what's interesting is how I came along to Chris is one and quiet light was one of the people um, who had uh, sold their site on on the Facebook pages talked about quiet light. So um, I thought, okay, I'm going to keep that in the back of my mind, kind of to just get an evaluation and see what's going on. And then really weirdly, um, I get this uh, message on LinkedIn from somebody who's like, hey, we're a new company in the U.S. and we were looking at purchasing websites. We really like your site. Came up as one of the things to do. Um, let's uh, you know, let's talk. So I talked to them. They were based in Germany. Had one representative here in the U.S. and you know, put an LOI in. And then um, it was it was a good number. And I was like, okay, well, you know, um, let's explore this. So then we went on trying to sell it. And then all of a sudden they had a shift in their business and they were from overseas and it was kind of crazy. And then everything fell apart. They came back with an offer that was significantly lower than the LOI for no apparent reason. Um, and um, yeah, it just got frustrated with them. And that was a six month ordeal of dealing with that. And I'm like, I'm going to call that Chris guy <laughs> from quiet light. I was so frustrated. And then uh, I called him and he was, fantastic. Um, he's like, okay, yeah, let's talk about it. What's going on. He's like, get me these numbers. And of course, as I'm sure you guys know, um, I didn't, I kind of dropped the ball and I was like, okay, I'm just going to focus on this. Now I kind of know what I'm doing, what it might be worth. Um, and then, um, as my business, my clinic here is growing. Um, then I just went, you know what, it's not fair to this business. If I'm even spending 10 hours away from it or less on something else, then how is this business going to grow? Right. So, um, and this is where I, I want to do through my retirement. And then, and then, you know, at some point build a little e-commerce thing for this business as well too, and use some of the content knowledge that I have now regarding and around this business. So that in 10 years time, I have an exit potentially for a retirement, right? So yeah. that's where I was like, you know, yeah, why don't I keep it and just have, you know, just manage everybody else running it. But it just wouldn't allow me to do then what I want to do with this business, which is really, again, what I'd love to do. And I think what I'm put on this earth to do. So it, it's got to be, I know that going through a six month process and having the deal fall apart can be very taxing emotionally. Yeah. It really um, you, you're, you're almost there. And then they, they come in and they offer you something an awful lot less. Uh, yeah. Just, just for the audience, I want to share some timelines. It looks like you signed an engagement letter on January 27th, 2023 with Chris you put the package together fairly quickly and launched the business for sale and went under letter of intent. It looks like 17 days later, maybe 18 on February 14th, 2023, incredibly fast. Right. So you oftentimes, you know, putting that client interview and all the details together takes a long time because people are busy. The owners are busy and it takes a while. It sounds like you really put your energy into it. So con congratulations on that. Um, and then you closed six weeks later, not six months, but six mm -hmm. weeks after going under LOI. Right. What a different experience you had. Yeah. Hugely different. And th that the advantage of working with, with the company like quiet light is the fact that, um, we did, we had an offer before it even went out to your meal email list. Like there were people who, um, had, uh, deals that were going, that were going through and at this particular party, their deal fell through. So they were ready to buy. I mean, it fell through and they were ready to buy, right? They were ready to, to, um, to they're committed, right? So they uh, came across then my site. So with the other people, they didn't have any sites. They didn't have any background. They you know, didn't really have anybody else to, you know, to offer it to, right? Whereas you guys have that pool of people, um, even, even besides the email list, kind of, I, I liken it again to real estate because I've been doing real estate for 20 some years is, it's before it gets on the MLS, right? That some of the brokers know other brokers before it gets on the MLS. They they talk to some people about it. Um, and that's kind of like, you know, to what you guys have that um, because you have so much experience and such a, a large pool of brokers, you know, you guys talk to each other and say, hey, you know, what about this one? And and so that was extremely helpful in making it such a, a shorter process and a, a still stressful, but much less stressful process. Six weeks of stress instead of six months with a positive <laughs> outcome instead. Exactly. Let, let, let's try to estimate your return on investment. You bought this business with an SBA loan. Did you put 10% down? Um, I put 10% down. The The deal with the um, the owner was, uh, I thought was priced a little bit high for the income. So I said, okay, well, then I'm asking you to hold 
a note. So um, they hold a, held a note as well after the sale. We decided to do it after the sale um, because really what I want, was going to use that note for was um, I was going to purchase products to then resell on the site, which I never quite got to. Um, but again, that was another thing for the um, the new owner to pursue as well if they wanted to e-commerce stuff. So um, so I was able to. And again, this I don't know if this is ever going to happen in anybody else's lifetime, but because of all the COVID stuff that was going on, uh, the pay first payment was deferred for I think it was four months or I think um, I think it was six months that it, the first payment was deferred for the SBA loan. And then um, I had the first three months deferred for the the note that the um, that the buyer held. So essentially I bought it for no money down, but I had uh, utilized my money to put down on the SBA loan. And then when the owner and I worked out a deal for um, holding that note that I was going to use for a fueling product, um, you know, essentially it was a no money down deal. That's pretty impressive. Uh, and you said you tripled the size of the business or tripled the value when you sold it? Uh, would sold it for double what I, double. almost very close to double what I purchased it for. Pretty good work. Three years and you doubled your money. Uh, mm -hmm. You doubled, you doubled uh, no money down. That's, mm -hmm. it, it makes me, Pat with, um, oh gosh, I'm forgetting her name. Oh no, I'm, I'm going to be in big trouble. I'm not, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not even going there cause she'll call me <laughs> a situation where yeah. somebody, you know, bought a business for 10% down and sold it, you know, a few years later and just the ROI on that, debt, yeah. that, that money down was just incredible. You know, Stacy, it's kind of amazing. Cause I've talked to a lot of even my friends that I have that are in jobs, corporate jobs, maybe lawyers been there 20, 25 years tied to an office to say, I just have to change this. What's interesting is you sort of followed the map of what I think they should do, which is to utilize SPA money, put a small amount of money at your at risk of your own, and then build an already existing profitable business. You did such a great job at that. And then obviously went through the situation to where, like I always talk to people, it's fine. We only care if people exit at maximum value. If they do it on their own directly, that's great. If you were successful, we'd be happy. But it's interesting to me that you traveled this entire path and then realized you needed an advisor to navigate some of that, uh, that thing. Because that's exactly what I think people should do is to sort of think think deeply and then reach out and try to find actionable tips to be able to sell the business. It's amazing because this is exactly the map that I talk to people about following. Great. Yeah. And, and you, you had a company teach you how to buy sites. You mentioned that earlier. Can you just share the name of that company for others to look at it as well? Do you recall? Uh, the, I can't remember the name of the company, but the guy's name, he's out of Australia and his name Jared. is Red Kraus. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we just had him on the podcast. Oh, Jared, really? if you're listening, what's the name of it? Um, yeah. it's, um, five businesses online or something like that. Um, my online business.com or something like that. Yes. Yeah. Something like that. Yeah. He was all great. Right. He helped me put, um, uh, like all the little pieces together. Like what I really like about his program is he said, okay, here are the brokers, right? Here's the brokerages. Here's, um, here's the, the parameters that you look for, um, uh, when you're wanting to buy a site. Um, what else did I really get from him? Um, you know, again, just a lot of those, where do I go? Like the internet is so huge and you don't know what has any credibility. So, um, and I tried another one that just, you know, I didn't feel had enough information that was helpful. Um, but I felt Jared's, um, information was really spot on and helpful. Um, after purchasing not as much, um, you know, help from that, but that's not what he's doing, right? He's right. not helping you build the site afterwards. Right. He's really helping you find that site. Yep. to um to purchase. So yeah, it's, uh, bu it's buying online businesses.com. There we go. They also have a podcast for folks to listen to as well if they want to learn how to buy a business. And I, I recommend yeah. it. Look, Pat and I and everybody else on the team are going to help you as much as possible. Uh, but technically we represent the sellers. So you want right. to just sort of demystify the whole process. We're going to help you. We're going to tell you all about it. We're going to follow as 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 your buyer did, right? Chris Guthrie walked them through that whole process and made it successful for both parties. And we have to, because we're not going to be able to help you, our client, without helping the buyer, because buyers never have representation in this business. Mm -hmm. um, but the more people can learn about that, the better. Uh, I'm curious, did um, you hire a company to help you with due diligence on the site when you bought it? Or what did you do there? Not with due diligence, but because I've, I still am terrible like at the back end stuff of running a site from the tech point of view. Um, I connected with a guy by the name of Dominic Wells, who um, has since moved on from doing this, but now now buys sites. And I think he just is trying to IPO his company. 
in regards to buying the sites, but he helped me with the transfer of the site. Uh, Cause it's big 2000 pages. And I'm like, Oh, I've, I've never had a content site before. How do I know everything's going to be moving well? And, and he had some affiliate background as well too. So um, he was going to take, we partnered and he was going to take the affiliate program and kind of build that up. And then um, he would get a percentage of, of things going forward. Um, so he was there. I, that was my kind of uh, strength that I found him interviewed a lot of different people prior to buying the site. I did have the six months, you know, before it closed. So I did do a lot of my due diligence of figuring out like, who can I work with? Who's going to help me with this transfer? Uh, landed uh, with Dom and he was fantastic. But then when we um, closed and he kind of took over everything, he had a team that was helping run the site for a little while. I was still doing the Facebook and the email and that's when it just took off like crazy. So a lot of the revenue that um, we had agreed would be split was actually coming from my work and not the affiliate work. So we agreed after, I think it was four or five months to go, you know, he was kind of looking at taking his company in a different direction. And um, I was more like, well, I don't want to pay you half of what uh, the work that I'm doing. <laughs> right. So we talked about, OK, what's what's a fair exit out of here? So then we parted in, in a good way. Um, and then he's doing it. He's killing it and what he's doing. And then I just kind of took over after that four months. I felt, OK, I know what's going on here. I can do it. And then what I did to help again with the maintenance is um, NerdPress. I don't know if you guys have heard of the work with them at all. They're like a maintenance site uh, or they help with maintenance of your site. So I didn't have to worry about like, um, you know, the Google alerts or things that you know, Google is telling me that the site needs to be adjusted. They, I, I paid them a monthly fee and there's three different tiers that you can utilize. And then they would take care of kind of all that stuff. I would still monitor it. So they were part of kind of this team that I assembled to put together. They would monitor everything's on the back, anything on the back end. And as far as speed insights and all that, I would do some research on that. And then I would say, all right, how do we make this go faster since I have video? What needs to be done technically? And they would help me with that. And they then help me hire somebody to change some of the things on the site. So our, our speed, our insights, um, page insights improved dramatically. Um, our domain authority increased as a result of the SEO plus the increase in speed. Um, so yeah, so this is definitely a village that helps this um, um, and, and being able to say, I don't know something, so I have to find the experts that that know more than me. Uh, and so I kind of became the little CEO of my site and found the people that were more knowledgeable in different areas than me and then um, put them together as a team. Stacey, okay, I have one final question on my side. I, I, I find it amazing. I mean, you're really humble about this because I think our listeners have no idea how difficult it really is to acquire a company, double it and sell it within that period of time, which is just simply amazing. Can you tell us a little bit about once you did that, where was there seller's remorse? Were you happy? Were you moving on to your new thing? It was it everything you wanted start to finish as you envisioned. So I think I have like little, um, what, what's the word? Little flashes of seller remorse. Like, but I, because I'm so busy doing what I'm doing now with my clinic that uh, I don't have time because <laughs> I, I just kind of keep my eye on that ball. Um, but I feel like um, everything that was kind of happening for the new buyers, I'm I'm really very happy for them as connected with them. They're very nice people. Um, I think they're going to do extremely well with it. And then there's always that little thing in the back of my mind, but dang it, <laughs> what, if I, what if I did it? But then I, I know I have to let that go and then to, again, focus on, okay, why did I even put it on the market in the first place? Well, this is why, because I have this other thing that's more uh, closer to my heart and really where I think um, I was put on this earth to do that, to do this. And I do love that as well, too. So uh, I don't have any regrets, uh, but there's a little bit of sometimes like, I mean, it wasn't my baby. I didn't start it. but it might've been my adopted, you know, teenager that I just kind of prompted and helped through college. And now, you know, it's going to go off and do some amazing things. Amazing. It's, it's natural to feel that way. You should be proud of what you did and focus on that instead of what we typically do as entrepreneurs, which is what if I did this? What if, what if I did that? You right. know, if I project this out, I could have waited and sold it for X. It's just, Right. Focus. On, I love the fact that you're focusing on the things that are closer to your heart and mm -hmm. that you you're mature Agreed. enough to say, you know, I'm good at this, but mm -hmm. it doesn't fill my cup. I don't right. love it. I like it. It's mm -hmm. challenging. I love the research. 
you know, but I, you know, I want to do something that really fills my heart. So really, really impressive. Congratulations. Thank you. I just, I wish we could all have great success stories like you are having now. So really exciting for you. I appreciate that. Congratulations. Thank you. And and Quiet Light really was a big part of uh, making the process more seamless. I tried it without a broker and, you know, wanted to choke the potential buyer at times. But and what Chris said was, you know, Chris made a lot of sense when I first told him about that story. And he said, you know, that's when I, the broker, would have been able to step in and say to the buyer, hey, you know, you guys, you know, this isn't the way, you know, get your head out of here, you know what, and let's, you know, get back on uh, where this should be. And that's what I was missing. So when um, you have a company like yours uh, and brokers like you guys are, it just makes the process, again, it's not like, no stress, but it, the process, you always have that person to go to if you're not sure about something. Um, and uh, Chris was great in helping uh, both sides, really. And, but uh, I always felt that he had my best interest in mind, for sure. I'm sure he did. Nice. Chris, Chris, a great guy, incredible experience. Um, so if anybody out there has a content site, they're thinking about selling and want to chat with Chris, he's, uh, email is simply chris at quietlight.com. Very humble, very down to earth. And uh, you'd be surprised when you dig into his background, how much experience and and success as an entrepreneur he he really has. Mm -hmm. Pretty incredible. Well, I know you've got a deadline here in terms of jumping over to your next meeting. So thank you for joining us. Thank you for uh, sharing your story. And big congratulations from all of us at Quiet I appreciate that. Really, it's been great to meet you guys. Yeah, congratulations, Stacey. That's awesome. Thank you.